I'm Caitlin E and welcome to the Lit Review. Today we're going to do a, an overdue August wrap up. So I know by the time you see this, we are over halfway into September, but it's taken me a minute to find my footing because there's some very big life events uh, happening for me in September. I will tell you more about that in maybe like a couple weeks time. But for now, let's focus on what I read in August. I'm going to try to do my wrap ups slightly differently than I have before, where I'm really only going to focus on what I'm going to call my high bar or the best thing I read that month and the low bar the worst thing I read for that month. But I will still talk about the books in between the high and the low bar. I'll just give you my star rating as well as maybe one to two sentences. I realized that for me, I love sharing my quick thoughts with you about books, but I was going in with way too much depth in my previous wrap ups, uh, which was still fun, but it made for really long videos that not many people were interested in watching. So I'm going to try it this way and see if that seems to fit our collective energies a little bit better. Ooh. Now I get to decide whether I want to start with the high bar or the low bar. Do I want to start with a rant or a rave? Hmm. Maybe I'll switch it up every month, but I think this month we're going to start with the high bar, the best thing I read in August. My favorite thing that I read in August is definitely Lovely War by Julie Berry. Like, wow, this book. This is my first Julie Berry, though she has other books out and about. I think this is arguably her most famous one, at least in the part of communities that I see talk about her work. This book spans World War I and World War II, but mostly follows uh, the stories of four young lovers in World War I, the first Great World War, uh, as it's often put in historical terms. But what's really cool about this book is that it's kind of uh, seen through the lens of the Greek gods. So if you're a fan of Greek mythology, you may know the story of Aphrodite and Ares' affair where Hephaestus catches them with a golden net and they are put on trial. That is the kicking off point for lovely war. And instead of being put on trial in front of all the Greek gods, it's an intimate courtroom scene where Aphrodite is trying to convince both Hephaestus, her husband, and her lover Ares that her job is actually quite difficult and underappreciated uh, and that she struggles to feel loved. And in doing so, she ends up telling the stories of those four young lovers I mentioned. This is, I believe, technically young adult, but wow, did it pack an emotional punch and really speaks to all the cool things that YA is capable of as a genre. So our four mortal characters are Hazel, James, Aubrey, and Colette. I think Hazel and James are both British. Uh, Aubrey is a black African-American soldier fighting in World War II. Uh, and then Aubrey is from Belgium uh, and also has like roots in France. So there's a really interesting dynamic with all of these different like world perspectives or allied world perspectives specifically. Uh, and the love stories are Hazel and James's two British uh, youths who have joined the war for various reasons. And and then Aubrey and Colette slowly fall in love across the course of the novel as well. Uh, even though this is not an own voices novels when it comes to Aubrey's story as a black African-American soldier during this time period, there's, it's very clear that there's a lot of care and research put into it by the amount of notes and uh, historical context that Barry has put in the back of the book, which was very rewarding to see. I did try to look up some extra reviews uh, from like BIPOC readers to see if they also felt like this was something that resonated with their communities. Uh, from what I could see on Goodreads, it did seem like there were some positive thoughts about how Aubrey was presented, particularly coming from uh, Barry's perspective. I sped through this. Part of why I want to rave to you about this is this pulled me out of like a mild reading slump. I read this at the tail end of the month and it was far and away one of the best things I read. I cried. I, I wasn't prepared to cry, but I cried. Uh, I laughed too. There was just such strong emotional resonance. I personally am a bit of a sucker for the overall setting of World War I or World War II stories, but this really tugged at my heartstrings and gave me the cry I didn't know I needed. Uh, for all these books, I'm going to try to link the story graph down below. I will try my best to articulate content warnings, but please make sure that you check any book you pick up uh, if you have things that you're concerned about running into. Uh, the things I can think of for content warnings just off the top of my head, uh, obviously gore, violence, issues of war and topics of war. Uh, you're definitely going to have a injury in detail at some point during this. Aubrey as a character also faces a lot of racism and some violence related to that racism. So please be aware of that going into this. Just 
things to consider for content warnings, but this book was truly one of my favorites uh, of August, if not of the year. We'll see when I hit that big end of year wrap up. So this is my high bar. This is the thing. Even it was one of the last things I read in August. This is the thing that just absolutely eclipsed whatever else I was reading this month. And I think I kind of skipped a step. This, uh, even though I talked about this as the high bar, this is one of 12 books I read this month and my average rating for August was 3.5 stars. So I kind of was all over the place a little bit, but let's talk more about that really quickly. For the rest of these, as we work our way through towards that low bar, I'm gonna give you the title, the author's name, uh, my rating, and then one to two sentences about why I felt the way I felt. Some of that may include summary, I'm going to try to keep that to a minimum because I think that's where I do most of my talking. So we're going to work our way down. And a lot of these are actually ebooks. I read a ton of ebooks this month. So I will be working in reverse order. The quality is going to trickle down until we hit to that low bar. My next favorite thing that I read was Unhinged by Onley James. I gave this four stars. You're going to be hearing a lot about the Necessary Evil series in this video because I've been reading them for a video that I'm already working my way through on this channel where I, where I read books about like the anti-hero the assassin, the uh, I've never loved anybody but you type of main character, and that absolutely fits the bill for all of the heroes in the Necessary Evil series. But Unhinged is the first in that series, and I would broadly describe the series as Dexter romances. <laughs> so there's that. And so far, Unhinged has been my favorite, but I'm not done with the series yet, so we'll see. Uh, then I read your Dad Will Do, part of uh, Katie Roberts' Touch of Taboo series. I also gave this four stars. Our heroine goes knocking on the door of her ex-boyfriend's dad because there's always been some weird tension between them and she's there to resolve it. Then we have a Head Case, again by Onley James, part of the Necessary Evil stories. This is one of the twins books. This is Ace's book and it is probably my second favorite in the series so far four stars. Next up I have Private Eye by Katrina Jackson. This is technically book two in the Spies Who Loved Her series, but it could be read as a standalone because it definitely fills you in on all of the stuff in book one. I gave this three and a half stars. I personally felt like some of the details were a little rushed and too short because I would have loved to linger with these characters more. But it is an action adventure themed love story between a cam girl and literally the spy who loved her. Then I have Psycho by Onley James, again, part of that Necessary Evil series. I told you you were going to be hearing a lot about that from me. So Psycho is, I believe, book two in the series, and it's the love story with August, who's arguably the most um, violence prone of the seven, and uh, his romance with a former FBI agent. Really enjoyed it. Three and a half stars, though. I, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but then I read Moonstruck, which is part of the Necessary Evil series by Onley James. <laughs> Why I liked this one is it does a lot to redeem Atticus after a uh, book one unhinged kind of makes you not like him so much. So it's Atticus's love story with a handsome mechanic who might be better at Atticus's job than he is. Uh, three and a half stars. That's it for now on the Necessary Evils uh, series. I'm still working my way through that, but you'll hear more from me in you know, when I wrap up that video. Then I went back to paperback for a bit. The Princess Stakes by Amelie Howard. This is a historical romance featuring Princess Sorani Rao as our heroine who needs to escape her kingdom in India because of a coup and runs right into the arms, or should I say the ship, of a former flame, the now Duke of Embry. Really enjoyed this. Gave this 3.5 stars because the time on the ship is much better than the time when they land in England. Next, this one was my monthly troll pick for August if you follow my uh, Litland TBR game, and that is Angel's Blood by Nalini Singh. This is part of her Guild Hunter series, the first in her Guild Hunter series, and this is my first Nalini Singh. Uh, it is a urban fantasy with archangels and vampires, and the heroine is a vampire hunter. I don't think I realized that her story was going to continue across multiple books as opposed to kind of like a companion series, and that kind of threw me a little bit. Not really the book's fault, much more my fault, but I ended up giving it three stars because I felt kind of unfinished business and not totally convinced I need to continue. 
Uh, next on the list is book two in the Wild Winchester series by Erica Ridley, and that is The Perks of Loving a Wallflower. This is a sapphic historical romance featuring the Winchester family's mistress or master of disguise. Uh, I believe Tommy could be classified as non-binary representation, though of course that was not common language during that time period. However, it is still a sapphic love story that is very charming, but it does take a while to get going, hence three stars. Next up, I read a pick from the Hello Lovely Trope of the Month subscription box, and that is The Brit by Jodi Ellen uh, Malpas. I have never read any of Malpas's work before, and this is part of the uh, Unlawful Men book series. Uh, the heroine Rose is a reluctant sex worker who gets looped into some intense mafia dealings uh, as she gets kind of kidnapped by our hero Danny but she's not that upset about it because the chemistry between them is electric. Uh, this was darker than my usual fare, but I didn't mind it. Uh, I did enjoy this, would probably continue on with the series uh, if I had the opportunity. So three stars from me, but intrigued. All right, so that's how we trickled down and now we're here at the low bar. This is the rant portion of the video. Uh, so my least favorite thing that I read in August, my low bar for the month, uh, was The Con Artist by Fred Van Lent. I gave it two stars. Did I mention that already? Despite its very cute comic-oriented cover, this was not that delightful to read. It's one of, ironically, the first things I read this month. And I say ironically because this ended up being my low bar and the last thing I read in the month, Lovely War, ended up being my high bar. Truly, the highlight of this is that you get these really cool pieces of artwork throughout, which I believe uh, are not the author's work. It's by an, an artist called Tom Fowler. He's the one credited with the illustrations throughout. Those are absolute highlights of this because it's really cool to kind of see the art style of comics come into the story a little bit. You may have seen Fred Van Lent's uh, work as a writer within the comics industry. He's done things on like Amazing Spider-Man or Marvel Zombies, which is truly one of my favorite iterations of like the modern era of Marvel comics. I love the Marvel Zombie run. So I was like really rooting for this. It's a murder mystery set at a Comic-Con where our hero, Mike Mason, is a comic book artist. So he's really famous for doing this run of a character called Mr. Mystery. Uh, and that's kind of where his, his fame is continuing to pull from, even though he's done other things. Uh, and so he, he kind of lives at Comic-Cons, just going from Comic-Con to Comic-Con across the country and even the world uh, because of his art skills. So he just like sits at a booth usually draws fan sketches and that's how he lives his life because his the rest of his personal life is a disaster like he's he's in the process of getting divorced uh, he has beef with a really famous editor in the industry so he's just kind of existing at comic cons until the one in san diego where this book is set where a lot of murders seem to keep happening around Mike and the police are very interested into why that is. He's trying to clear his name and kind of outdo the police in this whodunit set at Comic-Con. If you're a big fan of comics or just like the superhero movie industry, uh, there's probably some fun little details that you can catch while reading this book. It feels very rewarding for those of us who have kind of gone to multiple Comic-Cons. I've been to at least one in San Diego and several across uh, the US. So there was like an aspect of talking about like Artist Alley and stuff like that that I felt really seen by, but you really kind of get tones of bitterness and uh, like jaded, jaded writer writing a jaded writer vibes from Fred Van Lent as the author. It feels like, I don't know, it felt really awkward at times. It felt really woe is me the comics writer, which is not to say that their life isn't hard because it's a really tough industry and I get that, but it just, I was not behind Mike Mason. He's a very unlikable character, but not in like a villain sense, just as like, you know what it is? Mike Mason feels like a nice guy who just doesn't understand why all the bad things keep happening to him when the answer is that he's just kind of an asshole and doesn't seem to see it. I don't think I want to read a lot of books from that POV personally. And I find it so disappointing and frustrating because there's so much about this premise that I thought was funny and witty and cool. And then the writing and the story of Mike Mason uh, and his like ability to seemingly outwit the San Diego Police Department with his limited capacity uh, and knowledge of, of 
murder and, and police work. I don't know. It's just not a, a, a style or a genre that really appeals to me. And that's what I learned throughout this process. It was my low bar for the month. But that's my wrap up for August. Uh, it was a busier reading month than I thought it was going to be. Uh, I didn't necessarily hit all of my lit land goals, but I still read a lot this month and enjoyed a lot of what I read. The vast majority were things I liked or in some cases loved, which is good news for me as a happy little reader. So thanks for hanging out with me and I'll see you on the next one.